Good morning, everyone. It is good to be here to share God's word with you. Before we jump into our passage today, I want to ask everyone a question. Um, it's kind of related to this picture. I'll just tell us how it's related to this picture before. But has anyone, have you ever looked at something and um, not seen what's there, but seen what it could be? My experience with this growing up was, uh, was my piano teacher. My t- piano teacher would always tell me, wow, Jonas, you have such large hands, you have such flexible fingers, there's so much unrealized potential here. Which was just kind of code for, Jonas, I wish you practiced more. <laughs> but she saw something there, she saw a pianist there that wasn't there yet. I was not there as a pianist at that point in time. She knew it would take a lot of work and a lot of practice. Michelangelo, the sculptor, has a famous quote that says, the sculpture is already complete within the marble block before I start my work. It is already there, I just have to chisel away the superfluous material. So I want us to kind of have that in mind. Maybe it's something that that someone once said about us. Maybe it's something that we see in someone else, but have that in mind as we go through today's passage and look at what God has to say to us through Hebrews chapter 12. So before we jump into the text, one of the things I want to remind us of is like what's going on in the big picture of Hebrews. We've gone through all of this about how Jesus is the great high priest, how he's he's better than Aaron, how he's, (coughs) excuse me, how he enters the real tabernacle and um, offers a, a better sacrifice how, um, how, how, he, had, how he, he came and the promise that he offered was this promise of all of these great people of faith. That was what they were looking forward to. And the context of Hebrews, right, is that God is chasing after us. God, why, why, did, why did God want to establish all these covenants? Because God wanted a relationship with his people. And so continuing in that today, um, we come to this passage about God's discipline, about uh, the hard times in life. And the author of Hebrews is going to go through, he's going to encourage us on how to walk through the challenges, and the difficulties in life. So before we jump into this message, would you pray with me? Dear God, we just thank you for this opportunity to be in your word. God, give me the words you want to say to your people. Um, Help me to share about who you are and help us to have the hearts to listen and to draw closer to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we think about something like discipline, we tend to kind of think of it in a negative context. And the whole broad kind of spectrum of this idea and a lot of what's going on in the book of Hebrews in this question is the readers of Hebrews are kind of asking this underlying question without saying it out loud. And we ask this question a lot too. Why is life so hard? Right? Maybe we don't ask it exactly in this way. We might ask, you know, if you have a, a series of unfortunate mishaps happen to you throughout the week, you might be like, why me? Why, why, am, I, why am I the sucker in life? How come, how come this one time, you know, the police want to pull someone over, it's me? Or maybe this, this one time, you know, some accident had to happen on, while I'm driving. It had to happen to me. And I think a lot of the readers of the book of Hebrews were asking this question. They're saying, I'm, living this, I'm trying to live this Christian life. Why is it so hard? So we jump into our text today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open or scroll to Hebrews chapter 12. Before we jump into verse 4, 
I want to remind us of verse 3. So verse 3, Pastor Bruce preached on, reads, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. So the author of Hebrews is asking us to think about Jesus. Think about what he went through for our sake. And from there, we pick up at verse 4. Now, as you can kind of tell already, my, my voice is not quite where it should be. So I'm going to ask you guys to help me out. I ask you guys to read this with me. So on three, let's read this together. One, two, three. So here it says, as we think about Jesus, we think about everything he's gone through. He starts with this thing of like, Jesus has gone through so much for you that what you're going through right now is kind of not that big of a deal compared to him. Now, it's probably not something most of us want to hear when life is hard. Like, oh, it's not that bad. Um, but it is a reminder that we see here life is hard and we're struggling and the struggle is not with like life but the struggle here is with our sin it's with what separates us from God and Jesus has gone through so much that he was even willing to die for that and so here now in our struggle Right? Because Jesus has gone through so much, we should kind of we, we should keep on keeping on. And it begins with this quote from Proverbs, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Because the discipline of the Lord, the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And this is a quote from Proverbs 3. And he's saying, God has established, God desires and has established through the struggle of Jesus a relationship with us. That's what he's looking for, that relationship. And so, as, um, as a father, right, he wants his children to become the best people that they can be, right? I, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Maybe for those of you that are parents, you remember having this experience with your kids. Maybe those of you that are not parents, you remember your parents doing this to you and you being very upset. And, you know, your parents may say something like, this hurts me more than it hurts you, or I'm doing this for your own good. And as a kid, I might stamp out and say, you know what, you don't get me. And you just kind of stamp out. And we don't understand and we don't see how much our parents love us and how much they want what's good for us. And this is, this is where God is putting himself right now. He says, I am like your father and I know that this is hard for you, but this is good for you. So the first thing I want us to think about when we look at this passage, right, because as it's, go, as it's talking about going through struggles, it's saying, think about it as discipline from God. And I want us to think about what is discipline. When we talk about discipline, I think there are two facets in which we can think of discipline. 
Usually the first facet we think of discipline is like negative discipline. You did something wrong, therefore I'm going to punish you for it, right? Um, you know, you didn't finish your homework, therefore no computer games for the weekend. That was a very common discipline for me. Um, you didn't practice piano, so you can't go to whatever party. You didn't do what you were supposed to do, so therefore some sort of negative consequence, right? Or you did something you weren't supposed to do, and therefore some negative consequence. But there's another type of discipline that we're all very familiar with, but sometimes we don't, at least I don't think of it as discipline, which is this idea of like positive discipline, right? Like the people that go to the gym all the time and are just like working out for the sake of their body. Um, you know, when I exercise, uh, and I'm like sore, and it, it hurts when, when you're just kind of working out, right? If I'm, on, if I'm on a treadmill running, there are points in time, usually for me pretty early in the workout, where I'm just like, why am I doing this? <laughs> like, like, why am I putting myself through this? It's like I'm, I'm literally running to nowhere. <laughs> or, you know, you're... you're you're working out, you're doing weight training, and you're like, I'm, I'm picking something heavy up and then I'm putting it down. And why, again, why am I doing this? Is, is, how, how does this help me? And we all know that in the long run, it does help, right? Our bodies are fitter, we can do more, we're, we're better able to um, live uh, a more robust, healthy life. And we understand that both in regards to positive and negative discipline, the consequences from this discipline, right? The, the temporary discomfort that I'm in now is hopefully well worth whatever whatever I'm trying to avoid in the future, right? Being fit, all the medical things that I may avoid in the future from exercising today are worth it, right? I would be in more discomfort in the future than the, the brief fleeting pleasure that I get from not exercising today. And so we see here that, you know, discipline is, is kind of looking ahead. I want to build up good habits, right? Like I want to build my muscle strength and I want to eliminate bad habits. Um, I went to school in Asia and those of you that have gone to school in Asia understand that a yardstick is not used to measure things. <laughs> it is often used to tell you what you did wrong very abruptly. Um, so it's, it's breaking those bad habits and building up those good habits, right? So that's the point of discipline. The point of discipline is to build us up, right? To build, develop those characteristics, those habits that are the people we're supposed to be and to get rid of those that are not good for us. So as we continue, we now know what is discipline. And we continue, um, if you could read this with me as, again, one, two, three. It is for discipline that you have to endure.
those who have been trained by it. Thank you. Amen. So we see here, right, the author is now reiterating that point. He says, it's because we have this relationship for God that God wants to discipline us. Right? And any of you that, that are parents or, or care for, for someone, um, you understand that discipline is, nobody really likes it, but it's necessary because of that relationship that you have. Go do what you want is probably the scariest thing that you could hear from, from anyone who you thought you had a close relationship with. Because go do whatever you want is saying, you know what, I don't care anymore. And God is saying, I still care about you. And this is why I'm letting you go through some of this difficulty, some of this hardship. In the discipline, in the hardships that we are facing, God is pointing our attention to either something that, that we need to build up or something that we need to get rid of. Now, someone asked me this question, how do I know if this is like from God? Um, and the author of Hebrews kind of says, well, all of these kind of suffering, just look at it as God's discipline because because God is pointing us to something in every single situation. An example that I really like to use is um, the example of patience. By definition, patience is putting up with something that you don't really like or enjoy. No one goes up to a teenage boy and said, man, you were just grinding for the past 17 hours on your video game. Man, you are such a patient person. No one, no one goes to, you know, someone and says, man, you've been binging Netflix for the last 48 hours and you finished five entire K-drama series. You have so much patience. No one says that, right? You say, man, I saw you at the DMV the other day, a place where it's good to go if you really want to develop patience. I saw you at the DMV the other day and, you know, you were waiting in line and the person in front of you was taking such a long time, kept asking the same question. You could tell that the DMV person was getting frustrated, but you just, you, you went in and you helped or the DMV person never lost his or her temper. Man, that's patience. A pastor once said, be careful when you pray for patience. Because what's the best way to develop patience? What's the best way to develop any muscle? It's to use it. So when you pray for patience, God might answer it and put you in a lot of situations where you need patience. But that goes to the point of, right, God puts these things in our lives to point out something in us, to point us towards something that, some, the person that he wants us to be, our sanctified selves, and he does this because he loves us and he desires to have this relationship with us, right? And so this comes to our next question. We know what a discipline is. Why is there discipline, right? And we talked a little bit about this. There's, there's the relational aspect. There's discipline because God has said, I am your father, and as your father, it is my responsibility to make sure that you turn out okay, God wants, has, has claimed not only that relationship, right? I, I think when a lot of times we think of God as, as Father and kind of telling us what to do, or sometimes I think of it this way, is like I, I tend to overlook, right, the responsibility of the relationship that he's claiming, and it's mostly this, oh, now there's this big other authoritative figure in my life telling me what to do and how to do it. But no, he does it because he loves us. He loves me, and he wants me to become a more godly, a better person. He wants me to become 
the person that he sees when he looks at me. He sees, right, you see what's there, but he also sees where it could be. God sees where we need to be, and he sees the way we need to get there, and he, orchestra- and he prepares our lives to help us get there. There's always a goal to discipline. It's never just there for its own sake. And God's goal for us is to live in perfect relationship with him as sanctified humans. I don't know about you, sometimes we think of, you know, there's a couple ways of looking at this picture. One is the kind of delusion model where I go home and I do a couple of curls and I think I'm the guy in the mirror, right? Because I feel the burn and so therefore, you know, I must be buff. But similarly, the other way to, uh, like, the other way to look at this is to say, when you look at that, when you see that in the mirror, that's, that's where I could be. If I put in the work, if I put in the effort, and I keep on keeping on, right? God has said, keep on keeping on, and, and you'll get there. And, and that's the encouragement of the author of Hebrews. It's hard now, but the end results are worth it. Here in the context of Hebrews, we see that maybe the Hebrews had, the the readers had some, we speculate the readers of Hebrews maybe were being persecuted in some way. From the text, we can maybe kind of guess that and maybe they're trying to go back to, to Judaism because it's easier. Um, the Roman Empire had a policy, generally speaking, which was if they don't cause an insurrection, leave the Jews alone because Jews back then would not, they don't, they don't want other people to become Jews, so they wouldn't try to convert other people. Um, whereas Christians, we as Christians, we want everyone to be a Christian. And that created a lot of headaches for the Roman Empire. And so in this hardship, though, the author of Hebrews is, is encouraging the church to persevere, to hold fast to, to who Jesus is, even though it's hard, to hold fast to the truth of what Jesus came and did for us, even though people might react poorly to it, and to hold fast to the truth of the relationship that Jesus gives us with God, even when it feels like everything is going wrong. And so ultimately, the purpose of discipline, as we said, one way to look at it is building good habits, getting rid of bad ones. But the ultimate purpose of discipline, I think, is our character. Who are we becoming as people? Rather than just, what do we do? Are we just going through the actions? And so in each season of our lives, maybe we're going through something very challenging right now. Maybe there is some sort of hardship. I encourage us to ask the question, what area is God trying to to get my attention in? Is Is there something in my life that God is trying to build up? could be patience, it could be being more loving, it could be being more aware of other people, it could be any number of things. And similarly, <clears throat> as we think about this individually, I encourage us to also look around us 
and think about this as a church. Maybe there's some things here right now where we say, you know, I'm not sure if this is really working out. Is God trying to get our attention somewhere with something here as, as a body of Christ? Because we remember that, that the book of Hebrews is written to a group of people. It's not just written to individuals. Now as we close, we finish out the passage. Um, if you could read this with me. This is the author of Hebrews now encouraging a response to the discipline. And this is the response that he encourages. One, two, three. Therefore... chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Amen. So as we read through this passage, we we think about this question, how do I respond to God's discipline? What's my response? Um, And so the first part of this passage is, I think, pretty straightforward. At least when I read it, I read up all the way to the part about Esau, and then I was like, and I was like, yeah, it makes sense. And then I read about Esau, and then I was like, okay, this is weird. But um, it all ties together in that it's our response to this discipline. Discipline gives us the opportunity to grow, but we have to take hold of it. And our response to that discipline is, will determine kind of the direction that we go. C.S. Lewis has this interesting quote, um, and, and it's, it's kind of, how would I explain it? It's a very, there's a little bit of like chicken and egg, like I want to feel the right way and therefore do the right thing from the right feelings. Um, but there is also an aspect of doing the right things will cause us to feel the right way, where our feelings sometimes follow our actions. And so it is um, a challenge to kind of draw that discernment. But C.S. Lewis says this interesting thing. Um, about loving your neighbor. And he says, do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Stop sitting there thinking, man, am I, am I loving towards my neighbor? But rather, he says, act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. And this is not just saying like, oh, just go through the motions and eventually it's gonna, it's gonna all work out. But I think, I think the wisdom that, that we can glean here from, from Lewis is that there are times when we're not gonna get it. There are times, right, we, we experience this even when we say like for people that work out. There are times when you're in the middle of your workout you're in the middle of practicing something. You're in the middle of, of something that seems very like tedious, mundane, but necessary in your life. And you're like, why am I doing this? Let's just get this over with. And, and the image that I get from, from these verses here, therefore lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, is someone who is like, I just need to, like, someone said I should run, and therefore I should run. And, and someone with, with weak hands, drooping hands and weak knees, they're not, they're not running properly. They're just kind of stumbling. It's like as long as I, if I stumble past the finish line, then I can say I did it, and, and that's it, and, and I'm done. And th- that person has, has lost sight of, right, the purpose of this discipline, 
And so the author of Hebrews here is now saying, we need to, you need to, you need to strengthen yourself. You need to do it right. And the example that he gives here is that, is, is one of, that what is lay may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. It's this, it's this idea of like healing, of physical therapy. I don't know if you've ever injured something before, but if you don't go through the process that you're supposed to, to, to get it right. I've sprained my ankle several times very badly. And, um, if I, I, and I can tell the difference between, you know, there are times when it's, after I sprain my ankle, I'm just like, oh, it's not too bad. I don't need to do any exercise. I don't need to do any rehab. I'm just going to go out on it again. And then the next week I sprain it again, and it's even worse. Um, but if you do do all of those exercises, you stay off that ankle, you, you play it safe, um, you, you do all of the strengthening exercises, then the ankle comes back as good, if not better, than before. But you have to do, you have to do it right. You know, one of the exercises for something like um, a sprained ankle, right? This is a very simple exercise that almost everyone tells you to do is, you know, write the alphabet with your toe while your foot is elevated. Now, I could do that, and I could very diligently try to shape every letter, but man, that takes a long time. So I'm going to wave my toe around in the air a little bit and say, like, I did the alphabet. It was cursive. Don't worry. <laughs> All right, I'm done. But in the long run, that's actually worse for me because I'm not really rehabbing my ankle. I'm not, I'm not reestablishing that flexibility. Additionally, right, I think how we respond to the discipline, right, if we, when we say, we say all of this stuff that's happening in my life, this is potentially God's discipline for me. He's pointing something out to me. How I respond to that tells, is, is very telling, I think, about what do I believe about God? Who do I believe God is? And so here it, it, it comes, comes into this part where it says, um, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. Right? And what is this, this root of, of bitterness? Um, I think here, the author of Hebrews is, is talking to us more in a, in, a, in a corporate sense, where he's telling us, like, hey, let's not get in each other's way. And let's you know, at a core of it, it's at telling us we need to, to love one another, even in these difficult situations. And understanding, right, learning how to see the big picture that God is seeing. And so it, this, this root of bitterness um, could be something along the lines of just someone saying something that maybe is true, but we just said it the wrong way, and it came across poorly. And so what this verse is encouraging us to do is to think of the other person. Finally, it jumps into this example of Esau. And, and it's this section can kind of divide it into two parts. The first part saying, these are the things you should do. This is what you should be like. You should lift your drooping hands. You should strengthen your knees, weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet. And then it goes into this negative example. Don't, but don't be like Esau. And what was Esau like? Here it references Esau selling his birthright for a bowl of soup. And at the end of the story, we know that, that Esau wants to get it back, but he can't. Right? Jacob has stolen the blessing from him. And the way that the author of Hebrews describes this 
is that he describes Esau as someone who lived in the moment. Man, I'm so hungry, right? Um, He comes back from hunting. Jacob is making some soup, some really good soup. If you want to know what that lentil soup might have tasted like, you can ask Alex. Maybe he'll make some for you. Um, But whatever that soup was like, Esau comes home and he's like, give me some soup. Man, I'm starving. Jacob says, sure, sell me your birthright. And Esau says this very famous line, I don't know if we remember this. Okay, what good is a birthright to me if I starve to death? So he sells his birthright to Jacob for this bowl of soup. He was thinking with his stomach, right? He didn't really think, oh, this birthright, this thing that that dad has in store for me, like, yeah, whatever. That's down the line. Right? And the stories about Esau and how he kind of thought with his stomach kind of go on and on and on. And that's one of the dangers, right, we have to, we have to be aware of because it's not just any one thing that, that kind of derails us, but it's this, this is sort of gradual buildup where, where we get off the, the, the track that God had us on through his discipline because we say, oh, you know, it's not that bad. Is this one time. Um, an example that came to mind for me, because um, I am an NBA junkie, is um, this dude. Now, those of you that, that don't know who this is, his name is Zion Williamson. He's a, he's a very unique player. People call him a generational player because he is so unique. He's a really big guy. He entered the NBA. He, was gradu- he did not graduate Duke, sorry. He played a year at Duke, plays for New Orleans now. He came into the league. Um, 6'6", 284 pounds, big guy. Over the course of his first couple of seasons, he got injured. He had a foot injury, he tore his meniscus, um, and uh, people started noticing that uh, after his injuries, he was uh, getting a little out of shape. Um, In the 2021 season, after his foot injury, he reported to camp over 300 pounds. People saw him in a, um, there, was a, there was a famous commercial that he was in where he's sitting on a couch playing video games with another NBA star and there's like a bowl of Doritos and like a Mountain Dew on the coffee table. And they're like, everyone's like, man, Zion looks humongous. Um, and I don't think, right, Zion Williamson was like, yeah, I'm just going to get out of shape. Forget it. Right, but it probably started with, well, I guess I can't move. I'm feeling a little down. You know, some comfort food wouldn't hurt. Maybe, maybe I'll get, you know, some, something not that healthy today. And then the next day, he's like, well, I still can't do anything. You know, when I, when I, when I can get back in the court again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna burn it all off anyway. You know, have that bowl of Doritos, that bottle of Mountain Dew. And the next thing you know, he shows up. You know, I'm sure he's still much better at basketball, even overweight than, than, than I am or any of us here. But, you know, he shows up, and it's, you look at him, and he's like, man, I don't know how that, someone like that can play basketball, let alone in the NBA. Um, you know, famously, he had, a, he had a workout before he was supposed to come back, and... Um, Two retired players, big guys, um, Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley, was like, said like, man, it's like, I think Charles Barkley said this. He said, man, it's like Shaq and I had a baby. <laughs> like he was really big. <clears throat> but I, I use him as an example because like, you know, I don't know if this is the case. I use him as an example because it's very, it was very like visible Um, You can go look up pictures of of Zion, look up Zion, Zion Williamson, Doritos commercial. You can see pictures of him. Um, But he, there was something in that discipline that you need for, to be a professional basketball player that Zion didn't have over that brief period of time. 
And it wasn't this like abrupt slip off where, where he just thought, well, this doesn't matter anymore. I don't think so. But it maybe started with something kind of small. And I think for, for us, as we think about um, the hard things that we're going through, and maybe some of the, the temptations that are there, that, that just one little, oh, you know, it's, it's not that bad. I'm, I'm going through a lot right now. Just a little bit, not that bad. But then we kind of circumvent, we short circuit the discipline that God has for us. So as we conclude, I want us to think of this question. It says in the passage that we respect our fathers who disciplined us as they saw fit, as they thought was best. And my question to us, as, our, as we go through difficult seasons in our lives, do I believe that my Father, the God of heaven, creator of the universe, knows best for me? Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this um, opportunity to see how you are working in our lives. Uh, we pray that, that we could see the challenges as your loving discipline, how maybe it could be worse, but um, we just pray that, that we would have our eyes and our hearts open to what you want to show us through where you are putting us in our lives right now. Continue to speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' name.